Welcome to another tutorial video. I want to make this one to cover a topic that we've gotten a lot of questions about, which is equity value and enterprise value in the context of leverage buyouts. And specifically, here is a really good question on this topic that came in the other day to give you an example of what I'm talking about. You've said that it's possible to earn an acceptable IRR, internal rate of return, in a leverage buyout, even if the company's EBITDA and EBITDA multiple stay the same, meaning that its enterprise value stays the same. This is because debt repayment and cash generation are also sources of returns in a leverage buyout. But your lessons on equity value and enterprise value also say that debt repaid with cash does not change equity value because the common shareholders are not involved. So how does this work in an LBO? Does debt repayment boost equity value there for some reason that it does not boost equity value outside the context of a transaction like this? I'll explain this a little bit, and then as always, I'll go into Excel and give you a demonstration of how this works. The short answer is the change in cash attributable to common shareholders, not debt repayment, boosts a company's equity value in a leverage buyout where its enterprise value stays the same. This happens because cash is a non-core business asset. So changes in cash could affect equity value because equity value is for all assets only to common shareholders, but changes in cash cannot possibly affect enterprise value because cash is a non-core asset and enterprise value is only for core business assets. But the next thing you have to check is if cash changes, that doesn't necessarily mean equity value will change. Equity value will change only if the change in cash was due to the common shareholders of the company or something related to them. For example, net income generated by the business flows into equity on the balance sheet, so that is going to affect equity value if it just goes into cash. Dividends, stock issuances, and stock repurchases would be other examples of items that can affect cash and also affect equity value because they're directly related to the common shareholders. Now, in an LBO scenario, you typically ignore stock issuances and repurchases and just set them to zero. So really, net income and dividends are the main items that are going to affect equity value in this context where enterprise value stays the same. The bottom line is that in an LBO, even if a company's enterprise value stays the same, equity value keeps increasing as long as the cash balance keeps increasing because of cash flows from net income generated by the company. It doesn't matter how the company uses this cash balance. It could repay debt or it could just let cash accumulate on its balance sheet. The only restriction is that the company cannot use this cash on core business assets, such as pp e or inventory or something like that, or then enterprise value would change because enterprise value reflects the value of those core business assets. Now, to make all this a bit clearer, I'm going to go into Excel now and give you a quick demonstration of how this works. We're going to use a very simple LBO model because I just want to show you the concept here. This will be a debt-free, cash-free deal for a private company purchased based on an 8x enterprise value to EBITDA multiple. The balance sheet will be very simple. The company will just have cash, debt, equity, and then accounts receivable, accounts payable, plants, property, and equipment, pp and &E, and inventory, the main items that you'd expect to see on almost any company's balance sheet. The growth margins and multiples will be as follows, 0% revenue growth, 40% EBITDA margins, and an 8x EBITDA multiple from beginning to end. In terms of cash flow and debt repayment, there will be a minimum cash balance of $25, and then all cash generated above that level is used to repay debt each year. Let's go into Excel now and see how this works. So here's our very simple LBO model. As you can see, revenue starts off at 250 and stays the same. EBITDA starts off at 100 and stays the same. We have some items for depreciation and amortization and interest. We have our taxes and net income. We don't have a full three statement model here. We just have our cash flow projections starting with net income, adjusting for non-cash items and working capital, and then CapEx. And then we have our debt repayment here, which I have yet to fill in. Toward the bottom, we are tracking enterprise value, which stays the same each year because the multiple stays the same and our EBITDA stays the same. So this is always 800. And then I haven't filled in this area for how equity value changes. We'll get to that as we go through this exercise. So let's start at the top here. We're buying this company for 8x EBITDA, which means that our purchase enterprise value here is 800. It's just the 100 of EBITDA times the 8x multiple. Our purchase equity value is 620 because we start with this purchase enterprise value. We subtract the debt balance when going from enterprise value to equity value, and we add the cash balance when doing that. So we get to a purchase equity value here of 620. Now we're funding this deal with 50% debt. 
So 400 of debt and 400 of investor equity. These both line up with the purchase enterprise value of 800. And we have our assumptions for minimum cash, the interest rate, the tax rate, and all the other normal things here. What I want to do is go into the cash flow projections and show you how this works. So first of all, in the post transaction column here for the debt and cash, this is a cash free debt free deal. What that means is that these initial numbers for debt and cash 220 go to zero immediately afterward. And then they're replaced by however much new debt is used to fund the deal. And then the cash actually goes to zero right after the transaction closes. So let's go in and fill those out. For the debt balance, I'll go up to the 400 right here. And then for the cash balance, this will just be a hard coded zero because that's the definition of a cash free debt free deal. The 200 goes to zero, gets replaced by 400. The 20 goes to zero. It's just taken by the private equity firm here and the cash immediately afterward is zero. Now for the beginning cash each year, we'll link to our cash balance here in the post transaction column. And then for each year after that, we can do the same thing. We can just keep linking to our cash balance right here. For the free cash flow, we'll take our net income. We will sum up DNA, the change in working capital, and then CapEx. And then for our minimum cash balance right here, remember we have this defined up at the top as 25. So I'll just take this, I'll anchor it, and then we'll copy this across. Now for the cash flow used for debt repayment, we are going to use a minimum function here, and I'll say the min between our debt balance right before this year, and then we'll sum up all these items, beginning cash plus free cash flow minus minimum cash. If you have that, I'll copy it across. So this gives us an idea of how much in cash flow the company can use to repay debt or let accumulate to its balance sheet each year. Now for the debt balance, we're going to take this number and then we're going to subtract the cash flow used for debt repayment right here. Copy this across. And then for the cash balance, we can just take our beginning cash, we can add the cash flow generated, and we can subtract however much cash flow was used for debt repayment. And we copy this across, so we can see it stays at 25 each year. So this is the basic setup for our leverage buyout model. You can see I already have the returns calculations over here. But now let's look at the interesting part, which is how equity value here changes. So for the beginning equity value in year one, we are going to go up Remember, this is equivalent to the post-transaction equity value. So we're going to go up and take the 400 from the investor equity contribution right here. And that's always the starting point for equity value in a leverage buyout. Now, this next part, change in cash attributable to common shareholders. For this one, we're just going to link to the free cash flow right here. This is simply the cash generated by the company's business from all its assets. So therefore, it's attributable to the common shareholders. It lines up with equity value. And then let's add this up. So the beginning equity value plus that change in cash attributable to the common shareholders. And before copying this across, I need to change the link for the beginning equity value to the ending equity value right here. We'll copy these and take this across. And look, there we have it. The equity proceeds in this deal, when we take the exit enterprise value, subtract debt and add cash, that's 669 right here is exactly equal to our ending equity value in year five. And so this is how the concepts of equity value and enterprise value work in the context of a leverage buyout. Now the internal rate of return here is not very high. It's only 10 or 11%. All the returns come from debt pay down and cash generation because there is no EBITDA growth and there is no multiple expansion. But you can see how potentially you could still get a viable deal here. Maybe if the numbers were a little bit better or the company's margins were higher or something like that. In this case, we're repaying debt and so the ending debt balance at the end is a lot lower. But let's say that we got rid of this. Let's say that we had no cash flow used for debt repayment. And instead our cash balance just kept getting higher and higher. Well, our ending equity value, 653, is the same as the equity proceeds, the 653 at the end in this case. So regardless of how the company uses this cash that's generated, whether it lets it accumulate or whether it uses it to repay debt, the equity value keeps changing in the same way. And that's the key point. It doesn't matter whether this line is zero or actually has something there for the debt repayment. Our ending equity value and our equity proceeds at the end will match in this scenario. So that's the basic idea. Now, a few other notes about this. 100% of the returns here come from debt pay down and cash generation because there is no EBITDA growth. There is no multiple expansion. This is unrealistic, but this is just an example to illustrate the concept. 
This rule about how equity value changes starts breaking down if the company's EBITDA or EBITDA multiple start changing, because then the ending equity value won't match the equity proceeds. When that happens, when the company's EBITDA or EBITDA multiple or both start changing, then the cut value of the company's core business assets also changes, meaning that total assets also change. So equity value in that case will now be affected by more than just the change in cash attributable to common shareholders, and you'd have to reflect these changes to calculate equity value. Let's look at a quick example. Let's go in and say that now we do have some revenue growth. So let's say we have 5% revenue growth per year. Let's also say that our EBITDA multiple here keeps increasing. It goes up to 8.5, 9, 9.5, and 10. Well, now, as you see, the ending equity value of 713 no longer matches the equity proceeds. That happens because more than just this change in cash now affects the company's equity value. So instead, what we have to do is the following. I'll add a new line here in Excel, and I'll say plus change in core business assets attributable to all investors. And for this one, we can take our enterprise value right here and subtract it in year zero, copy this across, sum these up, and now we can see it matches up. 1,189 and 1,189 right here. So the ending equity value matches the equity proceeds at the end of this analysis. Now, if the opposite happened, if the company's value started decreasing and this went to 7.5, 7, 6.5, 6, 5.5, something like that, the same thing we'd ha would have happened. The equity proceeds of 615 would match the ending equity value of 615 right here. So that's how you have to factor this in. The bottom line though, is that when enterprise value stays the same, really only the change in cash attributable to common shareholders will affect equity value. But when EBITDA or the EBITDA multiple start changing, then you have to factor in this change in core business assets. I'll just label it that for now. And then you can get to what the company's equity value changes to each year. Let's do a quick recap and summary now. The change in cash attributable to common shareholders, not debt repayment, boosts a company's equity value in a leveraged buyout, assuming that its enterprise value stays the same the whole time. So even if a company's business is stagnant, equity value keeps increasing as long as the cash balance keeps increasing due primarily to the net income generated by the business. But as soon as EBITDA or the EBITDA multiple change, meaning that enterprise value changes, equity value will not follow this rule. Instead, you must factor in the changes in the values of core business assets then, as we did in our simple Excel example right here. So that's a little bit about how equity value and enterprise value work in the context of leverage buyouts. Hopefully this now makes more sense to you and you can understand leverage buyouts in the context of equity value and enterprise value and understand how those concepts work together.